I was aboard the Oxford from January 1968 through November 1968. Prior to the Oxford, I was stationed at the Naval Security Station on Nebraska Avenue in Washington, D.C. Just prior to my last year in the Navy, I decided to volunteer for a ship off of Vietnam. It was an interesting year. I met some great people and we went places only ships like the Oxford would go. The USS Oxford was originally a World War II cargo ship of the Liberty class. Liberty ships were a class of cargo ship built in the United States during World War II. Though British in concept, the design was adopted by the United States for its simple, low-cost construction. Shown in their final days are the USS Oxford and the USS Jamestown, where they were decommissioned in Japan in 1969. Mass produced on an unprecedented scale, Liberty Ship came to symbolize U.S. wartime industrial output. This is not the Oxford. This is a typical Liberty class ship. The circled guns and cranes on this ship were typical of Liberty class ships, but were removed when the Oxford was converted. Our teletype and cryptography rooms were on the tween deck forward. No one needed to announce the anchor dropping. The CTRs were in this area with their headphones, typewriters, and radios. This is where we CTs and others slept. By the way, CTs stand for Communications Technician. The ship's store, mess hall, and kitchen were in this area. The other half of the crew slept in the half sleeping area. The other CTs, such as CTIs, the interpreters, CTM, the maintenance men, and CTT technical work here. I tend to not spend much time at this end of the ship. The library was a room in the cargo hold. I believe it was also used for church services. Water ballast filled the bottom. One time in 1968 we had a leak in the ballast and the ship had to pump out water as we made an emergency return to Pacific Bay for repairs. It looked like we were bleeding yellow blood onto the South China Sea. The yellow color was from a rust inhibitor in the ballast water. The ship was powered by oil-fired boilers producing steam to run a three-cylinder piston steam engine such as this. It was a wonder to see if you wish to see one run, the Jeremiah O'Brien in San Francisco occasionally operates theirs. The engine room was hot and noisy. I spent very little time there. I wish I'd spent more. One memorable item in the engine room was a large, maybe 30 inch diameter air vent hanging from the ceiling. A pair of Navy dungarees was belted to the vent and fully inflated with both legs distributing air. Liberty ships were not just cargo carriers, they were also converted to various other World War II uses. There were 2,316 general cargo, this was a standard ship. There were 62 tankers, they deliberately retained dummy or redundant deck equipment to prevent these ships from being identified as tankers, which were desirable targets for submarines. There were 24 colliers. These represented a major redesign to meet anticipated peacetime requirements. There were 247 troop ships. These were required at relatively short notice to carry prisoners from North Africa to prisoner of war camps in North America. These carried 504 men each. Six were converted to hospital ships. 44 were converted to box transport. These ships were designed to handle heavier loads than the standard Liberty ship. They were directly operated by the U.S. Armed Forces rather than by civilian organizations. 11 were converted to repair ships. Repair ships were built to maintain equipment away from the normal heavy repair facilities. 
The first of the 2,711 Liberty ships was the SS Patrick Henry, launched on September 27, 1941, and built to a standardized mass-produced design. 2,710 ships were completed as one burned at the dock. 200 were sunk by enemy action. The 250,000 parts were prefabricated in various parts of the country. The largest pieces were 250-ton sections. The sections would be delivered to the shipyards for assembly. Normal assembly time was 70 days. One Liberty ship, the USS Robert D. Perry, was built in four and a half days. The Liberty ship cost about $2 million back then. There were 16 final assembly shipyards scattered around the country. The one that produced the most ships was in Richmond, California, which was 489 Liberty ships. The SS Aiken was built in Portland, Maine. Liberty ships had a typical load of many different weapons, food, vehicles, and other equipment. Because so many ships were lost to submarines, 200 Liberty and 1,344 other ships, the cargo was widely distributed among ships. The Merchant Marine had a higher percentage loss of personnel than any other service, with 5% of the men lost 11,324 men. The Marine Corps lost 4.7% of their total, 19,546 men. Most Liberty ships were named after prominent deceased Americans, except for one, Francis J. Ogara, was thought to have been killed during a Japanese submarine attack on his ship, but was actually a prisoner of war in Japan and lived to see his name on the ship. Captain Hugh Molzak was the only black captain of a Liberty ship, the USS Booker T. Washington. It was planned his crew would be all black, but he insisted it be integrated, and it was. During this time, various Liberty ships under his command made 22 round trips, transporting 18,000 soldiers to the war theater in Europe and the Pacific. There were 11 Liberties named after blacks. The USS Oxford originally was the Liberty ship SS Samuel R. Aiken. The Aiken was launched on July 31, 1945. She was delivered to Moore McCormick Lines on August 31, 1945. Mr. Aiken had served as superintendent of the U.S. Shipping Board during World War I. Mr. Aiken was also vice president of Moore and McCormick and had joined Moore and McCormick in 1919 and supervise the reconditioning of the American Scantic Line ships. On April 10, 1948, she was stored at the National Defense Reserve Fleet, Wilmington, North Carolina. This photo is the only photo of the SS Samuel R. Aiken I could find. The ship would be converted to the USS Oxford. In October 1960, Samuel R. Aiken was towed to the New York Naval Shipyard Brooklyn, New York, for conversion. Named Oxford, HE-159, on 25 November 1960, she was commissioned at New York, 8 July 1961. This is the Oxford Christine. The ship hull letter definitions can be a little confusing. The A always means auxiliary in this case. G is general, and in the case of the Oxford, it was started as an eight AG-159, and then it became an AGTR-1. A TR means technical research. The AGERs are auxiliary general environmental research. The Oxford was the first of the AGTR series. It was followed by the USS Georgetown, USS Jamestown, USS Belmont, the USS Liberty. The Liberty was attacked by the Israeli Air Force and Navy with a loss of 34 men and 171 wounded. 
This is the USS Liberty after an attack by Israeli aircraft and boats during the Six Day War. It was claimed that, that it was an accident, but check out other sources for different opinions. It barely stayed afloat. I worked with one of those killed, Phil Tadiki, in Washington, D.C. at the Naval Security Station. He was truly a nice person. Similar but smaller ships were the USS Banner HEER-1 and the USS Pueblo HEER-2. In January 1968, Pueblo was captured by North Korea with one crewman killed and 82 imprisoned for almost a year. The Pueblo remains the second oldest U.S. ship still in commission. The USS Constitution is the oldest. The USS Pueblo is still in North Korea as a tourist destination. It is kept in great condition, right? The other side of the USS Pueblo is not so well maintained. The Oxford departed Norfolk for January 1962 for a South Atlantic deployment, returning four months later. Another four month South Atlantic. Atlantic deployment followed in May 1963, after which Oxford underwent overhaul at Norfolk. In the fall of 1962, early in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Oxford made slow figure eight patterns in the waters just off the coast of Havana, Cuba. The Oxford was essentially brand new at the time. Apparently, the Cuban government was not happy with the Oxford's operations and they send some gunboats out to investigate. Trescom, Tentacle Research Ship Special Communications, was one of Oxford's publicized operation. It took place 15 December 1961 when she became the first ship to receive a message from a shore base facility via the moon. The system was tested again in 1968, so I can brag that I am one of the few humans to bounce words off the moon. That and two dollars will buy a 24 ounce can of Steel Reserve beer. The communications, by the way, was exceptionally high quality. This photo and a following photo are from the 1964 cruise book. The Oxford was redesignated a technical research ship, AGTR-1, on April 1st, 1964. She departed on 4 August on yet another South Atlantic cruise conducting research not only in electromagnetic reception, but also in oceanography and related areas. She returned to Norfolk 1 December. January 1964 brought refresher training at Guantanamo Bay. From 22nd February until 10 June, Oxford conducted further research operations in South Atlantic and Pacific waters. This is a photograph from the 1964 cruise book. This picture is from the 1964 cruise book. This is a photo of the ship underway in smooth waters. This was the barber uh, this is not the barber we had when I was on a ship. I don't know if this was a special Navy rate. Maybe somebody else can explain how the barber worked. This is the captain's boat. It was rarely used in 1968. I think this picture was probably from the earlier 1960s. It was a nice boat. This is the Panama Canal. I really don't know why they went from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Maybe somebody can fill us in in the comment area. 
This is another picture of the Oxford underway. The Navy commonly used a helicopter to do these pictures. We had some in, taken in Subic Bay. All personnel had to go below decks. Oxford steamed for Africa on 3 February 1965, calling at Las Palmas, Canary Islands, Lagos, Nigeria, and Durban, South Africa. This trip to South Africa must have been absolutely wonderful. The ship went a long ways to places that most Navy ships never get to see. In May 1965, the Ox, as some called it, received orders to continue to Subic Bay for duty off of Vietnam. This trip crossed a vast ocean which most people will never see. This was my first view of the Oxford. I went aboard in Bangkok, Thailand, January 1968. The first person I saw when I got to the ship was Chief Chelson. He was an instructor at Pensacola when I was there. I did know one other first class who I worked with at the Naval Security Station in Washington, D.C. This is a general idea of where the Oxford spent its time in 1968. Basically, we would travel from southern Vietnam around Vung Tau up to Da Nang, which is pretty much the full length of uh, Vietnam. I should say South Vietnam. And then occasionally we'd go over to the Philippines, probably four or five times. We went to Hong Kong at least once, maybe twice, and then Bangkok, I think, twice. In 1968, two um, 50 caliber machine guns were added to the ship. One was on the uh, left side, one was on the right, the port and starboard. They were put on after the uh, USS Pueblo was attacked. We had no guns to speak of until we had these installed at Subic Bay. No photographs were allowed in secure areas, so this is a photo from Pinterest showing a similar CTO room. These are the same tel teletype machines we use, so this is roughly similar to where we worked on the ship. Actually, this is much larger. The starboard anchor chain broke in 1967 with no injuries to anyone, but it was a very dangerous situation where several men ran for their lives. Because of the loss of weight on the starboard side, the ship listed port for several months until the anchor and chain were replaced in 1968 at Civic Bay. For a well-written description of the anchor chain out of control and breaking incident, go to this website or maybe do a search for Oxford too deep for the ox. This is a photo of the anchor detail with uh, the associated steam. Steam was produced in the engine room and used to run steam motors for operations such as this. Some supplies were brought aboard from our well boat. It was always nice when an aircraft carrier wasn't in Subic Bay. Their vast crew crowded the bars. The aircraft carrier moored at Kubi Point, which was in Subic Bay, Philippines. The food was always good on the Oxford. I always liked breakfast. The bread was always good. Oh, the sweet rolls were excellent. I think it's remarkable that we never ran out of anything when we were on the Oxford. It's a real credit to the Navy and their distribution process. Of course, this includes the crew and the officers on the ship. I do remember one time where an E3 from our working space had to work in mess duty, and he brought us a gallon of strawberries, which was uh, quite delightful.
By pure accident, I was at a museum in Bangkok when the Shah of Iran was driven up in 1968. Truck bodies in Bangkok were not welded. Instead, they used lots of rivets. These are three friends in the sleeping area. The head of the restroom is through the open door in the back. The CTO branch, which I was, had three men on watch, I believe. And so there were nine CTOs, roughly, plus the chief and, and perhaps a first class. I still have my coffee cup. In fact, I have one with my name on it and one without my name on it. The one with the name on it was given to me by a friend. The U.S. Coast Guard occasionally came out from Vietnam to get ice cream and exchange movies. One night they came out at night and the bridge thought we were being attacked. We went to general quarters, just like in the movies. They were lucky we didn't sink them. This is the view from the bridge where the captain and the uh, people who ran the ship were. The only time we went up in the superstructure was to burn our classified information in, a, in an incinerator that was up there. One time we were burning bags up there and we had about 20 bags outside of the incinerator and a spark caught the 20 bags on fire and I didn't think we were going to get it out, so I went to the bridge and told the officer on duty about it. He told me to lay down a hose. I, by the time I got back, the Zimmer had put the fire out. This is likely Da Nang, Vietnam. It was at the far north of South Vietnam, and it was always overcast. There were lots of sea stories told about previous cruises. One was that uh, we stored our blank teletype paper in heavy boxes below decks. And there was a small freight elevator which was supposed to help us, but it was broken in 1967 or so, when a CT had the idea to ride up in the elevator along with the paper. The elevator fell quite a distance. When Dave opened the door, Ed was shaken, but the only damage was that his teeth clamped down hard on the pipe and broke it. I'm sure the right names were told us while I was on the ship. Dave and Ed are not the right names. Interestingly, the elevator was never fixed while I was on the ship. This is the Oxford Seal. It was typically put on jackets that we wore. These are friends. I wish I remembered all their names, but I'm sorry I don't. It's been a long time. Maybe somebody can tell me who they are. This is in the sleeping area and this is the entrance to the forward security area. I wish I had a picture of the door. It did have Snoopy on a doghouse there and I think it says keep out and it required um, I believe a code to enter. It was where the CTOs and CTRs were. The names I can remember are Gregson on the right and I think O'Neill next one to the left. The ship was exceptionally well cared for when I was on it. We had a first class bosun's mate who was very, very careful about how the ship looked. The officer who was in charge, the engineering officer, also seemed like a really neat guy. This is me in the sleeping area. For the first several months I was on, we didn't have air conditioning that worked very well in the sleeping area. And the, remember, we sweated a lot at night. This is the captain's dog, Foxy. He was pure white, very uh, playful. We saw him occasionally, not all the time. I guess he spent most of his time with the captain. One morning off of Vietnam, while at anchor, we woke up to find a Vietnamese fishing net encircling our ship. The 
fishing boat that caught us was a mile or so away. Our crew gathered it on deck and rolled it into a six foot diameter ball. The captain had a CT linguist on board and the crew may have tried contacting the fishermen by radio, I am not sure. The ball was finally lowered over the side where the intent was to have it float while we left. The fishermen could pick it up later. I do not know how this all went after that. This is one of my friends on the ship. I, he and I both smoked pipe at the time. I don't smoke one anymore. He probably doesn't either. Note the gunners made with a rifle. I'd forgotten that they walked around armed probably when we were near shore or at anchor. This is a typical CT ready for battle next to our new 50 caliber machine gun. A few times off of Vietnam in 1968, the captain had a boat lowered over the side and we swam in deep water. The gunner's mate stayed on the ship and he had a rifle to kill sharks. We never saw any. As I remember, we jumped into the water from the ship, perhaps about 15 feet. We swam for 15 minutes or so. We then climbed into the whale boat and we each drank two black leg beers. We had to climb cargo nets to get back on the ship. The only time we wore whites was when we had Liberty on shore. These friends were obviously getting ready to go on Liberty. They weren't wearing their tops to their uniform to keep them clean. These are the guys that I traveled around Hong Kong with. I think we took a tour. This is Hong Kong Harbor. I once went to Kowloon on a ferry. I'm sure Hong Kong is unrecognizable to me now. I believe this was probably taken at the floating restaurant in Hong Kong. I remember it was kind of a treat to eat there. This is Hong Kong Harbor. At night when we had to stay on the ship, because I think one third of the crew had to stay on the ship at night when the others were on Liberty. I remember we watched the great race on deck. Of course, it didn't hurt that Natalie Wood was in the movie and she was one of my favorite movie actresses. This is likely from the floating restaurant in Hong Kong. The Oxford needed a little help from tugs in Hong Kong Harbor. This is the hospital ship USS Repose in 1968 in Da Nang Harbor. We often came to Da Nang for supplies, medical care, and mail. One time, we had to leave the harbor early because there was some sort of an impending attack, and we had to leave one guy there who was having some dental work done. While he was in Da Nang, there was a rocket attack that he was involved in. He got back okay, but had stories to tell. One time, I volunteered to help uh, load some supplies on the repose and they used a landing craft like this. That landing craft did not include the soldiers. This is a World War II or Korean War view of the interior of the repose from the internet images. This is a rare glimpse of the AGTR-3, the Jamestown, our sister ship, and they were also on duty off of Vietnam. I think we only saw them one time. The main difference between the two ships was the location of the moonbound antenna. Theirs was in the center of the ship, more or less. Ours was at the aft, the back. 
This is our whale boat. It was used to get mail and to get to shore. Once it was lifted in heavy seas, and the boat's coxswain driver was lifted with a boat. He was badly shaken when waves caused the whale boat to slam against the Oxford Harb several times. I'm sure he still remembers that. This is a picture of the captain's gig, which is another name for a boat. Our captain seemed to be content to use the regular whale boat for his transportation. Rear Admiral Ralph Cook, who was director of the Naval Security Group, visited the Oxford in 1968. He actually came to our communication center and I happened to be on duty and talked to him. In doing this movie, I discovered we had quite a bit in common. We both were born in Montana, worked for IBM, were cryptographers in the Navy, and worked at the Naval Security Station in Washington, D.C. We didn't end up at the same rate or rank in the Navy. During World War II, he escaped the Philippines by the last submarine before the Japanese took over. He had quite a great career. He seemed like a really nice guy too, by the way. Mail arrival by our whale boat, usually from Bung Tau, Vietnam in 1968. This is our main mast and it was covered with antennas. Some called it the Christmas tree. This is the view looking up at the same mast. In 1968, the seas varied from glassy smooth to 10 foot waves. We had a few rough days when it was hard to walk. When it got really rough, we had to stay below deck. Anything not bolted down, tipped over, food trays slid around in the mess hall. While peaceful on the ship a few miles offshore, the Vietnam War raged onshore and in America. This was the year that Martin Luther King was killed and Bobby Kennedy was killed. Man would walk on the moon next year. We had a United Press International teletype that would bring us the news on these events. This was an oiler providing fuel in 1968. I remember one time the captain announced over the loudspeaker after we were finishing oiling that everybody should stand by for acceleration. That was a little bit of humor because our ship was the slowest ship in the Navy. These are two nice guys. In the latter part of 1968, our group CT Communications had a great officer, Mr. Rogers, and a great chief. I don't remember the chief's name. This is a picture of him though. Our ship was well taken care of. These are painters taking care of the ship while underway. The job was not for the fearful, as it was quite dangerous. This is a photo taken of the Oxford, or maybe the Jamestown, from an oiler. From the ships, it appears that both ships are still, and there's a river running between them. I always enjoyed watching replenishing at sea. In 1967, before I was on the ship, the Oxford experienced a typhoon and boiler failure. The Oxford nearly drifted into Chinese waters. An ocean-going tug reached them in time. In 1968, China was not as friendly to the U.S. as it is today. Many of us grew a beard and mustache during our time on the Oxford. As you know, much of the work we did on the Oxford was classified. One extreme case of this was one time my chief told me to take a chair like this one up on deck at midnight and throw it over the side. He said there was too much effort to do the paperwork to get rid of it properly. It was very unusual to go up on the top of the ship at night. And when I went up there, I thought as I threw the chair over, over the side, how no one would ever know if somebody fell overboard at night. Note the fishing poles leaning against the side of the ship. I talked to an Australian sailor once in a long pole and he mentioned that he'd seen our ship and that it was fairly bristling with antennas. The Australians had really beautiful ships.
This is the stern of our ship. It was common to see fishing poles stacked back there, but I never saw anyone fishing. I think there were some that did it in past cruises. This is the USS Lowell next to the USS Oxford at Civic Bay, probably. The USS Lowell was a destroyer escort built for the U.S. Navy during World War II. She served in the Atlantic and Pacific Wars, providing destroyer escort protection against submarine and air attack from Navy vessels and convoys. She was named in honor of Gunner's Mate, third class Harry James Lowe Jr., who was awarded the Navy Cross posthumously for his brave actions on the USS San Francisco. He manned a gun to the very end while fighting off Japanese aircraft. We spent a lot of time at Civic Bay getting our ship repaired. And next door to Civic Bay was the Lagopole. It had hundreds of bars. The music was great. They could copy anybody. These Jeeps were World War II Jeeps that were converted into buses and taxis. This is a photograph of resupply and underway. When involving food, those of us not on duty would join a bucket brigade to get hundreds of boxes of meat, vegetables, canned food, etc. from the deck to the galley. It was interesting to watch the food go by. I remember seeing frozen steaks from Australia. Well, it didn't mean much at the time in looking at these ship numbers. The uh, destroyers Buckley and James both served in World War II and had interesting stories, such as being involved in the Apollo returns, Korean War, cruise ship rescues, etc. Any ship there has a history that you just kind of don't realize. This ship had better days. This is the river on the way to Bangkok. We passed a Greek freighter on the way and a crewman ran the entire length of his ship to lower the Greek flag as a courtesy to the Oxford. There's a little history behind this. The U.S. Navy dips the U.S. flag only in return to the dip red rendered by another ship when any vessel under the United States Registry or Registry of a Nation formally recognized by the government of the United States salutes a ship of the Navy by dipping her flag, it shall be answered dip for dip. I'm sure the Oxford reciprocated. We rarely saw other ships at sea. I believe this is a military ship, probably American. The USS Oxford was in service for eight years between 1961 to 1969. During that time, only about 2,400 men served on her. I hope that this video brought a few memories back to the crew, families of the crew, and it helps others understand the ship's history. I want to thank my wife, Sherry, who sent me perfume letters on the Oxford nearly daily before we were married and has continued to support me all these years, including helping me with this video.